I was once asked if you could take a look into the life and mind of one person from the past, who would it be? Instantly, my brain cracked open its spine and, and pages worth of influential people ran through my head like Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, even a John Calvin, Jeffrey Dahmer, or Augustine, but strangely, my thoughts became obsessed with the idea of being invited into the heart of someone we all know as Judas, a man beckoned by the Son of God to follow him, follow him like Twitter was reality, paralyze his eyes on the heels of a God who had placed himself on the inside of a woman's stomach that he intricately created himself eternities before birth even existed. Judas walked with Jesus. I picture him Jewish, coal colored hair, dark brown eyes twinkling with deceit, heart beating with wonder towards this Christ whose features were just like his. Could this man really be God is what I'm sure plagued this dark and eclipsed mind. He watched him, watched Mary's 30 something year old son shovel the remains of rocks and death into his hands called dirt, bring forth spit from the same mouth that lit every star in the galaxy. He mixed them both painted them into the pupils of a man whose eyes were only acquainted with the canvas of black blind from birth god it was the first thing that man ever saw as last name is scary first name judas stood front row center to a concert of god's glory i wonder if he saw himself in the scenario before him maybe not but he continued to watch as christ walk towards the cave of a man who had been dead for almost a week with a heart that had not beat for four whole days, ears that will only work at the sound of something greater than death. Lazarus, come out, Jesus yelled with the authority of the Alpha and Omega branded to his breath. A fraternity of power coming forth from the same voice that spoke everything into existence with nothing that existed, just him. Judas saw a corpse come to life. A dead heart beat to the soundtrack of a resurrection, the metaphor for why Jesus came right in front of his eyes. If I could watch him think, I don't think he saw just yet, yet he watched as a year's salary of oil was worshiped onto the son of man's feet. Mary used her hair like a wash rag to wipe the foot of her Lord. And I wonder if Judas was confused, confused at why this woman would give up so much just for Jesus. Could it be that her reverence was a sign that she might have seen this Nazarene called Christ for what he was worth possibly, but he kept watching. He watched as the guards grabbed the man he'd identified with a kiss to prepare him for a death that the world deserved unaware of the resurrection that only the elect would share in. If I could, I would assume that he looked into his palms, followed his fingerprints into the 30 pieces of silver laying dead in his hands with joy, tap dancing in the cemetery of his soul, ghost of the structure rising up in his bones, those dark brown eyes staring at the receipt for what he just gave up. And I bet he didn't even see the reality of what he thought God was worth. Nothing, see, betrayal is easy. And you kiss God goodbye in a heart that is only loyal to itself. As Jesus was being led away into the cup of God's wrath, Judas crawled his head inside of a noose. And the truth is, I know he was sorry. His conscience made him conscious of the fact he had betrayed an innocent man. But the blindness in his mind didn't drive the navigation in his eyes to find that same man that was able to forgive him of all of his sins. So he made suicide his savior as I watched the rope hug his throat. I just wish I could have let him ball my eyes so that he could finally see, see that he was the blind man and needed the hands of Jesus to rapture the scales from his brown eyes like braille prates danced on God's fingertips. Let him rip my mind so that he could have understood that he was a Lazarus by nature, dead or corpse with breath, sleep in a cave of sin, desperate for life. He walked with the one person who could save him from the pitch black of night underneath his eyelids for three whole years. But try, try asking a blind man to lift his eyes toward the sky and tell you the color of the sun. If he can't see, he'll never understand his need for light. So darkness will be all that he knows. As I watch the body, Judas lay dangling dead from the tree, reminiscent of the piece of fruit that birthed this inherent blindness in his genes. I actually saw myself hanging.
Well, good morning. Welcome to Open Arms. Powerful video, huh? Makes you stop and think. We focus. We're aiming towards Easter. When Jesus comes back from the dead and guarantees eternal life to all who follow after him. But a lot takes place before two weeks from now, Easter Sunday morning. And one of the things is the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. And how it was the plan of God and how he fit in and questions. What difference can it make in our lives? What truth can we learn to make a difference in us? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for wanting us to be together here this morning. Lord, please keep the promises that you've made in your Bible about pouring out your Holy Spirit upon all those who gather by the name of Christ. And guide us and direct us in our worship. And might our lives be transformed. And I always ask, Lord, that you'd make us a little bit more like Jesus. As we pray in his name, amen.
But this time we dismissed the children to go down for a kids club. And uh, for the rest of us, I invite you to grab hold of that program. And please reach inside and grab the connection card that you find there. We're going to take the next couple moments to fill these out together. And uh, I invite you then to keep the card nearby. We're going to come back to it near the end of our worship time. And as is our custom, each of us is going to be encouraged to take at least one next step in our spiritual journeys. And some possible next steps are outlined on the back of the card based on uh, our worship time together. So let's take the next couple moments to fill these out, please. Without a doubt, my favorite songwriter uh, as, a, as a lover of music is Jackson Brown. 1976, the album The Pretender came out. Really, the title song from that, if you think about Jesus, is The Pretender. <laughs> Free Methodist publication, Light and Life, is arrived for April. There's some on the table back there with a nice purple. Have you noticed the new tablecloths and stuff? we got some fancy people around here. I had nothing to do with it. Okay. Yeah, obviously, look at those shoes. <laughs> yeah, got to love the shoes. That works. Uh, there's also some, uh, if you go out this way, there's some on the table there. And so I invite you to grab one for yourself to read. And if you have a lunch room where you work and you want to put a couple there, and you can do that, grab some of those as well. In your program, you also found a couple of things that were there. One is an envelope. I encourage you to use it. If you would like to make a financial donation to support God's work through open arms, please uh, put it in the envelope and put your name on the envelope if you would. You also found an invitation to Easter worship. Now, if you didn't know it before, now you know you're invited. It's only two weeks away. I'd like you to take this invitation and uh, give it to someone else. Family member, friend, somebody at work, you know, whatever. Just, hi, I'd like you to come to Easter worship. Tell them which service you'll be at and go from there. If you'd like me to send an invitation to someone on your connection card somewhere, put their name and their address, and I'll make sure one gets out in the mail this week to someone. But the most effective way to do this is for us to personally hand it to someone else. And there are some more of these invitations on the back table uh, that we have there. Ten years ago, hard to believe, ten years ago, the first weekend of April was when Open Arms officially launched as a church. Some of you were here that very first weekend. You've stuck around. Crazy, like the rest of us. It's a great thing. God has done some miraculous things in our lives. He's done fantastic things. Uh, 
we maybe have some different questions about him and his work in our world and in our lives than when we first started to follow Christ, when we first became a part of the family here at Open Arms, but there's nothing wrong with that. We don't need to have all the answers. We know the one who is the answer, and his name is Christ Jesus. My prayer is that God would continue to work in and through our lives and that we'd be even more useful in nudging people into the very presence of God. Even as we deal with the struggles of our own lives and the lives of the people that we love, I pray that even in those dark times, God would use that to shine the light of his presence into our lives and then reflect into the lives of others. I'm excited about, I don't know how much time we have going forward, but I'm excited for the next 10 years. How's that? Let's aim towards that. Let's stand together then as we sing.
I invite you to be seated. Jesus, you are indeed our deliverance from sin itself and the guilt and shame and death that comes from it. You are our deliverance from anything that would impede our ability to live within your presence right here and right now. You have given all things for each and every one of us. So great is your love. You willingly left all of the glories of heaven to become like one of us, except you were perfect. We're not. You were sinless. We're not. And you willingly lived that perfect life. And then you followed the plan of your father. The only plan that could make it possible for us to be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with you. With your suffering and death on the cross of Calvary. Yes, indeed, we look forward to two weeks from now when you conquer death itself for us on that first Easter Sunday morning. But you were willing to go through anything and everything for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have promised to pour out your Holy Spirit in our lives when we choose to follow after you. Continue to do that, Lord. Because we're still broken people, hurting people. There's things going on in our lives or in the lives of family members or friends or someone at work or school or heartaches and hurts, disease and death. Some days, Lord, more questions than answers, more problems than solutions. But we cry out to you and ask that you would guide us and direct us, Lord. Unstop our ears to hear you and our eyes to see you, Lord, especially as we face the more difficult things of life. And continue to deliver us to make us to be who you want us to be and who we can be because of your gracious mercy. And we ask these favors as always in the name of Jesus. Amen.
is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. I invite you once again to grab hold of that program, and if you'd like to do the fill in the blanks for today, grab that purple pen that you find in front of you. We're going to talk today about planned betrayal, planned betrayal. We look at the things that transpired in the life of Jesus, especially uh, the last week of his life, if you will, between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday morning and, and so forth, and we see the arrest, we see the mock trials, we see all sorts of other things going on. And we realize, if you look at the record that we find in God's Bible, in the Gospels, the first four books of the second half of God's Bible, we discover there that Jesus wasn't caught off guard by any of it. 
He wasn't surprised by anything. When the soldiers showed up in the garden, it wasn't like Jesus said, oh, I didn't see that coming. No, he knew all about it, even Judas' betrayal. In fact, Jesus' betrayal by Judas was foretold in the Old Testament. There were some promises written by God's ancient spokespersons that were hundreds of years before Judas betrayed Jesus. In John chapter 13, verse 18, we read these words. Jesus said, I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. It's a quote from Psalm 41. Then from Matthew's Gospel, we read this. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me? If I deliver him, him being Jesus, deliver him over to you. So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. And we see reference to 30 pieces of silver in both Jeremiah the prophet and Zechariah the prophet. So it was foretold, it was part of the plan of God, if you will. And even more than that, we discover by looking at God's Bible that Jesus knew who of the 12 would betray him. He knew it. John chapter 6. It's the same chapter where we find like the feeding of the 5,000, multiplication of the bread, all that kind of stuff. We find these words as well. Jesus said, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. Could you imagine the feeling to have Jesus say, you're a devil? Ruh-ro. Not a good place to be, huh? And then the writer of the Gospel of John makes this editorial comment. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. And then from John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, his account of the Last Supper, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. If we go to Matthew's Gospel of the Last Supper, we find there where the disciples are questioning, is it, is it I? Am I the one who's going to betray you? And that kind of idea is what led to da Vinci's famous painting of the Lord's Supper. There we see it. Now, it doesn't accurately portray what probably happened in the upper room. Okay, this was probably at the point where Da Vinci showed up with his art supplies and said, all right, all you guys on one side of the table. <laughs> no, it didn't happen that way either. It didn't happen that way. But Judas is at the table. Fascinating thing about Judas. He's right there. And what does he have in his hands, perhaps? Could it be a bag, 30 pieces of silver? Interesting. We'll have to check it out later. Google it, you'll get a millions of hits on it or whatever. And some people even try to zoom in even better so you can see it. But G Judas has the audacity, if you will, upon taking the payment of sitting at the table with Jesus. Wow. Wow. In John's Gospel, Peter is across the room after Jesus says that one of you guys is going to betray me. And you read in John 13 where Peter kind of gets John the Beloved's attention, kind of like, psst, psst. If you're sitting next to Jesus, ask him who. Ask him who it is. Well, the other guys are going, is it me? Okay. Leaning back against Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved asked him, Lord, who is it? Now, this is very specific here, okay, as Jesus answered. It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. I can picture Jesus grabbing a piece of bread, holding it up. Which, when I have dipped it in the dish, then taking that bread, he, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Who is it, Jesus? See this bread? Going to dip it in there. I'm going to hand it to the guy who's going to betray me. 
Actually, if you're at a banquet and the host way back when would take a piece of bread and serve you, it was an honor. You were a special guest of the host. Jesus uses that to point out the betrayer. Strange, huh? Strange. What in the world's going on here? We read in the gospel records that Jesus didn't stop Judas. He didn't stop Judas from going out with his bag of coins and the desire to betray Christ. And the thing you find in reading the gospel records is the fact that neither did the other 11 disciples who were in the upper room, did they try to stop Judas. And I wonder especially about John, the beloved disciple, if he's the one who leaned on Jesus and said, who is it? And Jesus said, this piece of bread, I'm going to dip it in, I'm going to hand it to the guy who's going to betray me. I would think in some sense John would try to tackle Judas before he got out the door. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. That's why he went to the authorities, the religious authorities that were out to get Jesus in order to come up with a plan of betrayal. Then we read, after Jesus took that bread, dipped it in there, and pointed out who was going to be the betrayer. As soon as Judas took the bread, we read in John chapter 13, verse 27, Satan entered into him. Now, I don't know what that would have looked like. I'm not so sure I'd want to see what that looked like. Why do I all of a sudden think of the exorcist and the spinning head and the pea soup? Anybody else remember the movie from way back, you know? I think it was a talkie, wasn't it, and it was in color? (laughs) All right. (laughs) The devil already prompted Judas, and then he takes the bread. I wonder if he ate the bread that Jesus gave him. And Satan enters into him. Now, I put it in the program there as a parenthetical thought that I have plenty of questions in my mystery bag, which you can't see, but it's always with me. I have plenty of questions in my mystery bag about Judas. Like, what was his motivation? We don't find anything really in God's Bible. We have scholars over the centuries who have tried to guess what was the motivation of Judas. Was he disappointed in the kind of Messiah Jesus turned out to be? Was he looking for some kind of political liberator to throw off the yoke of Rome and give the Jewish people freedom again? Did Jesus not do something for Judas that he really wanted done? And Judas kind of held a grudge? I don't know. I don't know what motivated him to make such an evil choice. A choice that Jesus had said, it would be better for that man who betrays me to have never been born. So we're not talking lightly about something here. And if anybody remembers a couple of years ago, that whole hubbub about the gospel of Judas and it was going to change the way in which we view Jesus and the disciples and so on and so forth. It didn't, I mean, could Judas have changed his mind? I just wonder. I wonder somehow between the planned betrayal of which one of the inner circle of Jesus' followers had to be the one who would betray Christ to those authorities, and the freedom of will that God gives to all persons, the the clash that must have been there in treating Judas like an honored guest by dipping the bread and handing it to him, would it not only point him out as the betrayer, but could it also have said, Judas, come to your senses and don't do this? I don't know, again, thoughts that rattle between my ears. If you have any answers to some of those questions, let me know. I'd love to hear them. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. And what happened next? So Jesus told Judas, what you are about to do, do quickly. Judas, Jesus rather 
not only didn't stop Judas, he sent him on his way. Get going. Do what you have to do. And John chapter 13 tells us that the other disciples thought since Judas was the treasurer and he held the money for the group and he actually stole from the group, that maybe Jesus was sending him out to help a poor person during the feast time. But yet, John knew, and nobody stopped the progression of things that were taking place. And why would Jesus let the plot unfold? I think there's one basic reason. One basic reason why Jesus didn't put a stop to anything and everything that was going on that was going to lead to his arrest and the mock trials and the suffering, the scourging, the dragging the cross outside the city, being nailed to a cross and dying a shameful death in public. One reason, Jesus came into the world to sacrifice his life for us. That's his expressed purpose for coming into our world and leaving all the prerogatives of divinity to live that perfect life and to offer that perfect life for us. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I know what ransom is because I watch a lot of like SVU kind of things and law and order and all. Anybody else binge watch? Yeah. Deb and I started Blue Bloods a couple months ago. We had never watched any of them. Now we're like, there's only 90 more episodes to go. <laughs> but you pay a ransom in order to gain the freedom of someone who has been held captive. We've been held captive by sin, by waywardness from the God who loves us. And we can't buy our way out. We can't ransom ourselves. But Christ gave himself as a sacrifice to pay the debt that's owed for us so that we could be free. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, Christ has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. And then at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, we find this statement. The next day, John the baptizer saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That statement was made three years prior to the, prior to the betrayal done by Judas. If we look at the Old Testament sacrificial system, there was sacrifice of many, many animals over the centuries. And you had to bring the best that you had from your flock, to bring the perfect one, if you will. But Jesus is the only perfect sacrifice. And all those animals that were offered point forward to the one who really can give freedom from sin. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-21 through 21 reads this way. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors. But how have we been redeemed? How have we been bought back? But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. God had a plan that he would bring us back into his presence once humankind messed up. He was chosen before the very creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Notice that raised him from the dead and glorified him. That's the spoiler alert that Easter is going to happen in two weeks. Yes, he gave himself, sacrificed his life for us. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He's alive forevermore. That's why it says on the invitation here, Jesus is alive not was, is alive, even today. So what, then? What does it matter for us? This betrayal and questions about Judas and his behavior and the disciples not being aware and Jesus not stopping things and this whole plan of God where Christ would sacrifice himself for us, well, what does it matter? 
Well, I find that one of the most amazing truths about the betrayal of Jesus is the fact that Jesus was truly in charge, even to the very end. Jesus was truly in charge, even to the very end end. Bible verse that's on your announcement sheet today is from John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18. Jesus said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus was in control. And if you should choose to read the gospel accounts of this last week in Jesus' life between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, you will discover that Jesus is in charge even when he stands before people like Pilate or Herod. Jesus owns the room. And that's putting it mildly. But on the other hand, what about Judas? Well, Judas was overcome by guilt and shame by what he had done. He tried to give the money back to the priest. I didn't think you were going to do this to Jesus. I was just trying to, we don't know what he was trying to do. But what happened to Jesus was not what Judas pictured would be taking place. And Judas even tosses the blood money back into the temple. And then he goes out and hanged himself. A tragic end. A tragic end. And still the questions are there. So what do I want us to remember? Remember, Jesus willingly gave himself for me. Jesus willingly gave himself for me. This coming week, try to repeat that phrase to yourself. Maybe in some of the most difficult places where you find yourself doing life this coming week. Remind yourself. Jesus willingly gave himself for me. And we will not be facing anything alone. Grab your connection card then, because what might be a next step in your spiritual journeys? Well, I told you there's lots of Bible passages, so maybe a step is to investigate these truths from God's Bible. And you can grab one of the Bibles. The page numbers correspond to what we have in the programs. Grab one and, and use it. We'd love you to take it with you. Maybe our next step is to accept Jesus' sacrifice for our sin for the very first time and to start following Jesus each and every day. Maybe we've kind of wandered away and we're sensing the promptings of God's Spirit that we need to come back to Christ and rejoin the journey with Him through life. I want to take the next couple of steps that are outlined here. I want to let Jesus have continuing control over my daily living. And I always ask that you'd pray for me as I'm praying for you and our prayer team prays confidentially for all of us because that's one of the best ways we can support each other in this journey is to pray for one another. I also want to resolve to be faithful to the Lord by obeying him. You've heard it said, but when Jesus says jump, we say how high, but we've already started to jump, right? I want to obey him. Maybe you do as well. Or maybe your next step is to return next week for Palm Sunday worship. Or maybe God's given you a special step to take and you want to use that blank line that's there. I also put a place there about I will prayerfully invite a blank line there to attend Easter worship with me at Open Arms. I invite you to jot somebody's names or initials or someone. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want me to send an invitation, please give me a name and address and I'll make sure it gets in the mail this week. In a couple moments, Jerry and Jim... We'll be coming around with some baskets. They'll be receiving the financial gifts we bring to support God's work through open arms and are also collecting our connection cards. So please, my friends, prayerfully take at least one next step in your spiritual journey and then please place your connection card along with your giving in one of those baskets.
again It's like my world's caving in And I try but I can't control my fear Where do I go from here? Sometimes it's so hard to